All right, so I think we're going to get started on this session called Data to Evidence, Odyssey in Action. So um, I'll give you a brief spoiler alert before I introduce Rebecca. Uh, this phrase, Odyssey to Action, I had a couple people like ask me, like, oh, what are you going to do? And I kept telling everybody, I'm not going to do anything. Uh, because we're, this session is about Odyssey in action, and we are Odyssey. So this is going to be a session where we're going to do something together. Uh, and um, specifically, you can think of this, this, uh, this session, it's going to be a little bit of a pop quiz. Uh, we're going to test what you've learned uh, from your prior time in the Odyssey community, from what you've learned today, from what you've seen in the various presentations, from what you hopefully gathered from uh, engaging in the collaborator showcase. Uh, actually, let me just, uh, one, one quick shout out. Um, uh, I did not get to talk to everybody at their posters, uh, but I did get to do a quick sneak peek of all the posters before we actually started. Uh, and there was uh, some amazing work. So I just wanted to give a shout out and congratulations to everybody who did showcase their work at the collaborator showcase. <laughs> So I hope that everybody did take in all of those posters because that information might be required for you uh, uh, later in this session. Um, it's my honor to uh, introduce Rebecca Chandler. Um, Rebecca is at the Uppsala Monitoring Center. Um, pop quiz number one, who previously presented from the Uppsala Monitoring Center? <laughs> Nicholas. Yes. So, uh, so Nicholas got to... Uh, to uh, uh, talk about all the good work that his department does and, and the, the important public health mission that, that UMC has. Um, Rebecca is a, an amazing clinician and scientist at Uppsala that's actually one of the ones executing the work of public health on behalf of everybody. And I had a, a really great honor to uh, uh, spend a few days with Nicholas and Rebecca and the entire team at UMC. Um, we had a, a great experience that Rebecca is going to uh, um, talk to you about. But what Rebe Rebecca is really going to tee up here is um, dive in a little bit further further into this use case of pharmacovigilance uh, and provide a very specific case that we all are going to think about um, what we could do as the Odyssey community uh, to put Odyssey into action to, uh, to help the patients that we're trying to serve. So Rebecca. Thank you, Patrick. So I'm going to start here. I want to have my first slide actually to just kind of go back in time and talk about the origins of pharmacovigilance. And we have to go back to the 1950s where thalidomide was commonly used to treat morning sickness for pregnant women. And in fact, it was actually given as a drug that was available over the counter in West Germany in 1957. And then a couple of years after that, what we started to see was the birth of children with various degrees of phocomelia or malformation of the limbs. And the birth of pharmacovigilance really was when Dr. William McBride in Australia wrote a letter to The Lancet in 1961. And he did two very important and yet simple things. He made an observation and he asked, has anybody else seen this? So in pharmacovigilance, perhaps the greatest challenge that we have is balancing uncertainty with the need to actually do something or action. So pharmacovigilance deals with generating hypotheses to try to ascertain the probability of a causal relationship between a drug and an adverse event. And yet we have to make decisions. We have to make regulatory decisions for the, in behalf of public health with usually no, without the evidence of a strong conclusion of causality. And so I give this slide, this was actually published from STAT just in August of 2018. So here we have new clues as of last year as to how thalidomide actually caused these adverse effects, and yet we had to act decades earlier. So what came of the thalidomide disaster was that the WHO, the World Health Organization, decided to make a pilot project back in 1968 and they join together 10 countries with the idea that we collect these observations, these concerns or suspicions of adverse drug reactions, and we pool them together so that we can identify potential safety concerns faster. This pilot project lasted for about 10 years. And in 1978, it was decided that this will be a permanent project, and we're going to the, uh, establish a collaborating center. 
The Swedish government um, uh, came to an agreement with the WHO, and that's how it landed in Uppsala, Sweden. And then in the mid-90s, actually, we took on the name of the Uppsala Monitoring Center, and we actually expanded our remit, and we do a lot of work um, in uh, advancing the science of pharmacovigilance, and then we also do a lot of work supporting many countries throughout the world. The initial group of 10 countries has grown to over 130 throughout the world who participate in this international program of drug monitoring. So we support them in their work, and then we do a lot of work in the science of pharmacovigilance. So just a couple of, of uh, points about us again, just to introduce us. So I've touched on the first two, that we were established as a foundation in 1978. Um, we're self-funding, and uh, we provide leadership and operational support to the, pro the, the WHO program for international drug monitoring. And then we're the custodian and the manager of Vigibase, which is the global database of suspected adverse drug reaction reports, which we call individual case safety reports. And then we're also the maintenance organization for Who Drug, which is an international resource or dictionary for medicinal products covering over 140 countries. Our vision, our vision is stated to be a world in which all patients and healthcare professionals can make wise therapeutic decisions in the use of their medicines. And we try to reach this vision with a number of, uh, through a number of channels. Um, as I mentioned before, we support countries in doing pharmacovigilance in their local um, national regulatory centers. We make available uh, different tools. Uh, we, have a, we have a data analysis tool here that we call Vigilize, that they have access to our database and they can see what other countries are reporting adverse events that they may have observed in their own countries. Um, we also uh, do an educational course for two weeks out of every year. We have a two-week course in pharmacovigilance where people come and, and, and learn about pharmacovigilance and how to uh, begin and maintain a pharmacovigilance program in their own countries. So uh, just getting back to what the data is that we work with. So again, as Nicholas showed, um, our data starts with a suspicion of a physician or actually a patient themselves um, telling us their experience. And the experience of an adverse drug reaction or ADR is a very complex one. And yet they tell the story to a physician or to a pharmacist and then it's captured in this ADR form. Um, as you can see here, I believe Nicholas showed the same one. And then what we have to do is fragment this report into analyzable variables, and we need to standardize this information, which we do with our medical dictionary, Who Drug, and then we use the MEDRA terminology. Then, of course, th this, this fragmented story um, must also be transformed in a way that it can be uh, transferred electronically into our database, Vigibase. So just a, a slide about Vigibase. So, um, it is, as I mentioned before, the global database of individual case safety reports of suspected adverse drug reactions. It covers about 90% of the world. Um, we have reports going back to as early as 1978. And we, um, are, we have a new data every Monday. So as of this past Monday, I can report that we had 18,800,662 reports. So the basis of signal detection um, in pharmacovigilance um, began, we can kind of think that it began um, with this gentleman here, Ed Napke. In the early 60s, he was the person who established the first ADR, ADR monitoring program in Canada. And what he did was he took the reports and in the pre-computer era, he sorted them in these pigeonholes um, by drugs and ADR. And so what he was able to do was actually see um, by the stack of the height in each of the holes, which, which of these ADR, drug ADR combinations might need to be assessed? Where have we seen the most uh, events for a drug? Um, today, the most uh, common form of signal detection uh, or statistical signal detection is, is disproportionality analysis. Um, and the measure of disproportionality that we use at the uh, UMC is, is called the um, information component, the IC value. 
but again, all based on the concept of are we observing more um, adverse events for this drug than we would expect. So, a couple of slides just to tell you about the, uh, the process by which we do signal detection. Um, we do it in a, uh, uh, a limited period that we call a sprint, and this was what Patrick came to visit us for in December. We invited him to come be a part of our sprint. And the way that this works is, um, this is kind of our overall process, and what we call the sprint is that we do some work to generate a list of drug, single drug, single ADR uh, combination lists which are generated by their strength of disproportionality. We also have a, a, an algorithm that we use in the UMC called Vigirang, by which we prioritize these drug ADR combinations. They take multiple uh, pieces of evidence, but uh, we believe that this will, the application of this algorithm tends to produce newly identified safety concerns. Um, so we, we have this table, and, and I'm going to show you what it looks like here in a minute. But during this sprint session, we all work together and go through this list. Uh, we do an initial manual assessment during the sprint period by which we look at the each ADR drug pair, and we get information about the drug, we learn about the ADR, we look at the labeling for the drug, and we determine is this, is this adverse event known for this drug, or is it something new? We start to make an initial assessment about whether or not this should be investigated further with other forms of evidence. So um, this is the overall process that we have in this diagram here, and that you can see that if we, if we after, a, after our in, uh, a further manual assessment, if we decide that a drug ADR combination should go for further assessment um, with multiple sources of um, research to support it, which I'll go through again later, we will uh, communicate the signal. So, since we're not a regulatory authority ourselves, we don't have any mandate to make any decisions, but what we do is we communicate any suspicions of new adverse drug reactions, um, drug uh, combinations to, to our, our national centers. And sometimes we publish them in the medical literature. So a couple of pictures from our sprint. So if you were, uh, as, as mentioned from my first slide, this is where we sit down with this generated table of drug ADR pairs that we think could represent a new safety concern. And we essentially just go through the list. Uh, we work um, in groups. Um, uh, we work individually, but we, we congregate uh, in groups so that we can talk with each other if we need to and reflect and uh, share ideas. So Patrick was here. And there is him working in his uh, combinations. And then we have other groups. And one of the things that we appreciate about doing it this way is that there's, it's a very multidisciplinary group here. We, we bring together pharmacists, nurses, doctors, and data scientists all bringing their particular skills to this, to this activity. So this is what our interface looks like, also in Shiny. Um, and as I remember, Patrick was Patrick quite liked this, so I made sure I was going to show it. So, what what we'll do is um, have a uh, you know you will log in, have a personal page, and this is all somewhat fabricated here. But um, this is the list. This is what I when I'm talking about a drug ADR combinations list. What you'll see is 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 the drug, and then uh, yeah the drug and then the event. And then you'll get some information. How many reports do we have? How many are observed? We'll, we'll know how many of these reports were serious, that type of thing. But we'll, this is ordered. It's ranked uh, based on our algorithm, as I mentioned before, which takes into account many pieces of evidence. But strength of disproportionality is there by this IC coefficient. And then we just kind of take them in order. There are some of us that cherry pick from the list. I'm a bad one about that. Just with my clinical um, experience, I tend to pick drugs and events that I'm particularly interested in. So that was the main list. And then you, we, we actually, I'm just going to show a series of slides how we do this. So we'll have some information there available in the, in the interface, which will tell us about the drug, will tell us about the ADR, as you can see there. We'll find more information about what ATC code, and then we'll have information about the ADR, usually up in, in the MEDRA hierarchy, so we'll know what system organ class or what higher level term it falls in. 
So this is the information about the case series or the, num the, the number of reports that we have that are reporting the same ADR with the same drug. So as you can see in the middle column there, we'll have information on the observed number, so how many reports we have, and then underneath you'll see how many we expect based on the database as a whole. Then we'll have some information about this number of series proportion, and then how many countries that they came from. Um, so we, 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 look at rep we look at drug ADR combinations that have reports that come from more than two countries. Then we'll have a summary slide of some of the demographics of the, of the cases that are included, each of the reports, that the, the patients that these reports describe. So here is what, this is the, the um, first vision of the particular case that we wanted to present for you to think about. So when, when Patrick was here, he was assigned or picked this combination of Nintididab, maybe I'll just introduce it. We, we, we all had a hard time saying this, so we called it Nintendo, which was easier to say. So Patrick and I always talk about it as Nintendo, so I think I'll just do that. But Nintidinab, it's called. And then, and then the, the adverse event was colitis. So as you can see here, the most important thing for you to know, of course, is that we observed, we had a 24 reports, uh, but we expected only, uh, only eight. Um, according to uh, our database. So we had an elevated um, information component or measure of disproportionality there. So the first thing that we need to do, uh, that we do in the sprint is uh, we get familiarized, we familiarize ourselves about the drug, and then we familiarize ourselves about the adverse event and the patient population that takes the drug. And then we also check the labels. The quick thing to do is to find out, I mean, is colitis known for this drug? So I've, I've taken a, the bit of the the relevant bit of the uh, US package insert or the summary of medical product characteristics if you want to think about the European label. And we see that there are two gastrointestinal disorders that are labeled for Nintendo, uh, that being diarrhea and also gastrointestinal perforation, with diarrhea being very, very common, commonly observed in the clinical trials, and uh, with gastro per gastrointestinal perforation being rather rare. So just a bit about the, about the uh, drug, as we learned uh, during this session, we had to do some research. So nintidinab is indicated for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, which is a disease um, uh, for which we do not know the etiology, of course, um, which is characterized by an excessive growth of fibroblasts. And it actually results in fibrosis of the interstitium of the lung. And uh, unfortunately, this disease has a very uh, high mortality rate and a median survival of only two to five years, um, and patients ultimately die of respiratory failure. Um, Nintidinab, or Nintendo, was uh, approved uh, based on two clinical trials, uh, uh, two pivotal clinical trials, which essentially measured the forced vital capacity um, in, in these patients, and it actually showed a... a, a uh, uh, a decrease in the decline. So uh, their uh, force vital capacity declined at a slower rate uh, on, nin on Nintendo. So Nintendo is a small molecule tyrosine kinase receptor inhibitor, and it works on three different types of receptors, the fibroblast growth factor receptor, the vascular epithelial growth factor receptor, and the platelet-derived growth factor receptor. And as you can see from this diagram here, two of these targets, the fibroblast growth factor and the VEGF receptor, I call it, the vascular epithelial growth factor receptor, both of them work on, on blood vessels. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a whole class of drugs, uh, the VEGF receptor inhibitors. This has been considered to be a target um, for a lot of oncology products. Uh, due to the fact that it inhibits angiogenesis, so the anti-angiogenesis drug. So there's an aspect of this Nintendo uh, that works similar to this class of drugs that inhibits the growth of blood vessels. Um, I've taken this um, bit of information about the adverse event management from the, web, from the company's website, because as I mentioned before, diarrhea was uh, a very common adverse, of, adverse event and I just wanted to point out that they, that they actually provide some information on how to manage this diarrhea, which includes supportive medications, dose adjustment, as well as dietary changes. Um, 
So there is some advice on how to, how to manage this ADR. So while we were sitting in the sprint and reviewing our 24 cases, if you remember, of colitis, it became clear that colitis was a rather nonspecific term. Um, we saw some cases that seemed like they could be ischemic. Um, in fact, we had colonoscopy results for some of these, uh, a couple of the cases. But we also saw some that could have been inflammatory colitis or infectious colitis. Or we wondered also about the possibility of just because a patient has so much diarrhea, maybe they're just being labeled as having colitis um, without really knowing the cause of the, di the, the diarrhea, uh, of the colitis. Um, so I worried about the specificity of that term, actually. I was worried that it was rather nonspecific. And when we looked and we learned about the drug and learned that it did have action on the vascular epithelial growth factor and so was, did have these anti-angiogenic properties, I started to look more closely at the possibility that it was associated with ischemic colitis to be more specific. So ischemic colitis is a condition which arises from the acute transient com uh, compromise of blood flow to the mucosa of the colon. It leads to mucosal ulceration, inflammation, and hemorrhage. And it can be difficult to distinguish clinically um, from other forms of colitis. So that's pretty much what my um, reports were telling me. There were Reports of colitis, some of which were, uh, that appeared to be of different types of etiologies. But in spite of this, it actually has a very high mortality rate. And I found this nice practice article um, from the BMJ here recently, which um, was pretty impressive. Uh, it, it was written by a gastrointestinal surgeon and gastroenterologist, but uh, they were um, pretty adamant on identifying um, ischema colitis from other forms of colitis. Um, they said that it, patients with acute onset of abdominal pain and diarrhea should be distinguished from other forms of colitis um, because they should undergo colonoscopy within 48 hours. And that is to determine the need, to determine the appropriate uh, way to manage them, whether or not they can be managed conservatively or they can be managed surgically. Um, so I found this to be really impressive given the fact that we had uh, advice from the company about how to manage diarrhea. So if ischemic colitis is very difficult to um, uh, differentiate from other forms of colitis, and yet um, it can uh, be very problematic if we don't identify it, I'm very concerned about the possibility of managing diarrhea or managing a potential ischemic colitis without, without colonoscopy, actually. So for us, it becomes a question of causality. That's what we're, we're stuck with. After we identify a drug ADR combination in this sprint, so Patrick identified this combination, we did some initial work, did not see in the label a specific warning for ischemic colitis. Then we take it for a further assessment. And really, the basis of our assessment in pharmacovigilance when we do this is, is to just go through the Bradford Hill criteria. There was a paper that was written around 2000, early 2000s, which actually uh, laid this out as a practice in pharmacovigilance and, and actually took each of the Bradford Hill uh, causality criteria and, and talked about what forms of evidence we have in pharmacovigilance that matches each one of those. So we routinely go through these um, uh, criteria, both with the evidence we have from the case series, the actual report adverse event reports, as well as supplementing it with data that we get from other sources. So I'm just going to start where I was, how far I felt that I was able to get based on the data that I had access to at the time, um, uh, trying to establish causality between Nintendo and ischemic colitis. So biological plausibility, this is my personal bias as a clinician when I do this, is that's the first criteria that I want to try to find evidence to support. I've learned that you say that's my philosophical bias. Um, but uh, I was able to find evidence that, um, that its mechanism of action on the vascular epithelial growth factor um, Actually, there has been a study here that I, uh, this is a review article from the, the authors of the people who did the original work, Kemba, 
at all, but they actually have a mouse model in which they were able to fluorescently tag, um, do some studies and show that if you, this is, it's panels C and D that are of interest here, that actually treatment with a vascular epithelial growth factor inhibitor um, actually shows regression of the capillaries in the intestinal villi. Um, so that seemed to support the potential uh, possibility to, to argue for ischemic colitis if, if this drug is actually uh, has, the, has the ability to cause regression of capillaries in the intestinal villi. So strength of the association. So um, the way that I kind of went about trying to look for evidence to support this criteria was, was to investigate in our database, do we have evidence of disproportionality for similar, for similar clinical terms? And actually, in the Medra Dictionary, ischemic colitis has a, an SMQ, uh, a standardized medical query, which has a, a lot of different uh, Medra PT under. Um, and I was able to pull out from our database those uh, Medra preferred terms that um, have been reported for Nintendo. And as you can see, um, we have colitis ischemic, intestinal ischemia, intestinal infarction. Now, they all show a certain amount of disproportionality. The numbers are small, and we only reach statistical significance for, if you want to call it that, for colitis ischemic. But even for some of the uh, intestinal ischemia, for example, we see more reports than we would expect. So I was feeling pretty confident that I could feel that there was some strength from, from spontaneous data to support this, uh, to support this causal hypothesis. And then I tried to tackle the criteria of analogy. And I did this by searching the literature for reports of ischemic colitis with other drugs um, that, have the, that, that work by inhibiting the vascular epithelial growth factor. And, um, and in fact, there are two reports, um, two case reports, that are reporting um, that are reporting ischemic colitis with, with other drugs in this class, them being a flibercept, uh, which is, uh, and biv bivacimuzumab. These are both monoclonal antibodies that actually don't act on the receptor, but actually inhibit vascular epithelial um, growth factor. Um, and, the, in, in, and actually, in both of these cases, uh, these, were these were administered intravitreally as they're used in the treatment of macular degeneration. So this is the point where I'm going to hand it off. So just to quickly summarize what I went through. So from spontaneously reported adverse event data, we generated a hypothesis of a potential causal association between a drug and an ADR. And then in our assessment of using that, those spontaneous data as well as some other data sources, we have tried to argue for causality going through the Bradford Hill criteria. Is that how I was supposed to hand off? <laughs> oh yes, the pharmacovigilante's dilemma. So our dilemma is always that a signal should be identified as soon as possible so that we can warn about it. That's what we learned from thalidomide and Vioxx and a lot of other stories. But we're always left with the question of, do we have enough evidence to go out and say this? So we wanted to explore with Patrick if he could help us. So who wants to play Nintendo? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, majority of people want to play Nintendo. Great. So it's good. How many of you guys have played Nintendo before? All right, mo more hands actually have played than want to play. So maybe that's, that's a sign of the times, I guess. Okay, so um, one of the things that uh, Rebecca went through that w for me was actually a, a big eye-opener and was very motivating from my experience of getting to go to Uppsala was this idea of the sprint. The idea that it is not one person who has to have all competencies to be able to do the job, but instead that a team of multidisciplinary skills can come together to actually solve these really tricky problems. So um, we're a team here, and lots of people want to play Nintendo. So um, I'd like you to stand up if you are an expert in the drug Nintendo. Rebecca, you should stand up. <laughs> Rebecca wasn't, but she sure as hell is now. <laughs> I still can't pronounce it. That's why I'm going to call it Nintendo. 
Okay, so we've got one person who knows the drug. So uh, I guess we could stop because all of you could leave because you don't know anything about the drug. Or we could think about being a team. We've got one team member who knows something about the drug. Uh, how many of you guys know something about colitis? Stand up. Okay. All right, so we've got, a, we've got like 10 and a half people who know something about uh, colitis. That's great, okay. Um, so how many of you guys know, uh, how many of you guys have access, direct access yourself to observational, patient level observational data? Stand up. Okay, so like half of you have at your fingertips data. That's good to know. Um, how many of you guys can write can write code, can write an R program to do an analysis on the data? Stand up. All right, interesting. Apparently there's a bias that programmers like to sit in the back, uh, which is an interesting, interesting characteristic. Okay. Um, uh, how, uh, how many of you guys feel like you understand the vocabulary and the coding schemes that would go into, even if you don't know about Nintendo and colitis, that you have a general idea that through a vocabulary you could figure out who's taking a drug that's coded as Nintendo and who's got a diagnosis of something called colitis? How many people feel like they know the vocabulary well enough? Stand up. Wow. I'm going to give a brownie point to Christian and Mui and Erica for doing a great job of teaching everybody that many people think that they know the vocabulary. Right? Million points for Mui. Um, all right. So lots of people stood up. Now what I want you to do is I want you to stand up if you did not stand up to every question I asked. Stand up if you did not stand up to every question. All right. All right? So none of us individually have the capability to play Nintendo, okay? None of us can do what it takes to actually address the question that Rebecca had. And this was the big eye-opener for me being at Uppsala was uh, I think what they've created is something brilliant. There's no reason that any one person needs to have it. What you need to do is you need to have a community of people who can actually can come together and complement each other's skills, where there's the data scientists and the clinicians and the, uh, um, uh, the, the folks with the data and the folks with the statistics that can all come together to, to play Nintendo together. Okay, so um, uh, Rebe Rebecca highlighted the Bradford criteria. I just want to kind of revisit this as just a framework here for a second. So, so um, Bradford Hill in his paper said, what aspects of that association should we especially consider before deciding the most likely interpretation uh, of it as causation? And so Rebecca said how far she's gotten so far. And what she said was she thinks she's got plausibility figured out, and she did a lot of uh, clinical adjudication of the VEGF receptor to kind of figure that out, and I'll, I'll give her that. Um, she said that she figured out analogy because she found other drugs that have similar mechanism of action that showed a similar effect, and so that makes sense. Bradford Hill would be happy with that. Now, she said that she had strength of association because she saw a disproportionality score in spontaneous data. But pop quiz, who presented earlier that said a disproportionality score might be an insufficient measure of strength of association? Nicholas. Nicholas said that maybe we need something beyond just a disproportionality score for strength of association. So I'm thinking I'm going to give Rebecca like half credit for this one. Okay. Now, I'm going to give her credit for one that she didn't take credit for, though, coherence. Because actually what was really impressive in my collaboration with Rebecca is I, I had this preconceived notion in pharmacovigilance that it was all about the cases uh, and that you know, there was deep drill down in individual cases. And, and indeed, the Uppsala team was very impressive in their thoroughness of working through cases. It was, it was really a great opportunity for me to learn. But what was most uh, interesting to me was how they quickly tried to gather every other piece of information that was at their disposal. And watching Rebecca actually tear through the literature and really try to basically answer the question like, does this actually conform to what we already know um, was actually compelling. And I think her example of what is ischemic colitis and why this might represent uh, is a good demonstration of, of, of uh, coherence. So I'm going to give her an extra credit for that. So I think that Rebecca got three and a half points on Bradford Hill's criteria. So the challenge that we have is that um, 
uh, Bradford Hill specifically provided us more viewpoints than just what Rebecca was able to finish. And so um, uh, we now are a community. None of us can do this by ourselves. But we've all just attended a, uh, a day-long symposium where you learned about different kinds of evidence we can generate, different kinds of standardized analytic tools that we can use, different types of data. You saw a collaborator showcase where people were showing various different components of activity there. So we are going to play Nintendo. First of all, you know, about half the room stood up and said that they had data. So shout out, what do we, we as a community, what data do we have access to right now? EMR, claims. What, which specific database? Oh, boy. Which, which data were presented today? Just shout them out. Cydia. Cydia. We've got data in Spain. Ipsy. Ipsy. We've got data here in the Netherlands. Same. We've got a database in the UK. May or may not be Europe. Do we see any other presentations of other types of data? The French one. We saw French. French data. There's SD. There's SNDS. SNDS. France. Good. What's that? U.S. claims. U.S. claims. We heard about U.S. claims. U.S. EMR. We heard about U.S. EMR data. Korea. We've got a bunch of posters from Korea. A hospital network across there. CPRD. We saw data across Denmark. Italy. We've got, we saw data from Italy. We saw data from Saudi Arabia. We have data from Japan. Did that cover everybody's data when you stood up? Brazil. Brazil's on there. Brazil. All right, pop quiz. George told you all about the number of unique patients that are in the Odyssey data network. What was the number that he said anyway? 500 million. He said we have over 500 million patients. Oh. Two. Three. You don't want to just scream at them? No. All right. So, so just in this room, we have an amazing. <laughs> now this one's working. <laughs> if you want me to it's leave, I'll just leave. We're gonna switch again. That's right. Now. Hello. Yeah. That is spectacular. I mean, everybody's waiting for the, for the next session. Peter, make no doubt about that. <laughs> Okay, so, so if we just think about the data that we have in this room, this is an impressive collection of data around the world. We've got data in North America, we've got data in Europe, we've got data uh, in the Asia Pacific region, we've got data in the Middle East, and that's just people sitting in this room. If we decide to play Nintendo together, look at the data resources that we have. Okay? Uh, Rebecca, did you have all of this data when you were trying to decide if Nintendo causes colitis? No. No, okay. But, but I, should, I should clarify which I didn't point out here, but I have reports. I do know, because we're a global database, that I do have reports, I mean single cases in my case series, from six different countries, some of Very which good. are represented on that list. Very good. So, so we know that this potential signal is a worldwide issue, and so it's actually really important that we have a global data network to address it, because this is not just a US problem or, a, or a, 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 any of these countries' problem. OK, pop quiz. We've got data. We need some analytics. You guys saw a bunch of really cool analytics that were being developed today. So tell me one of the particular analytics tools that you saw that you think might be useful if we're going to play Nintendo. Atlas. Atlas. What are you going to do inside of Atlas? Build a You're going to build a cohort. OK. What kind of cohort? <laughs> we're going to find new users of Nintendo. All right, we're going to find new users of Nintendo. Any other cohorts we might want to study? Colitis. We're going to find people who have colitis, patients with colitis. OK. <coughs> Anything else that you want to do in Atlas? Take the we might want to think about some negative controls. 
Anything else that you think we might want to do? Yeah, so we're going to get new users of Xbox, okay, which for those who really are annoyed that I'm not talking about scientific things, that's going to be a drug called perfenidone, okay, it's another drug for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis that I didn't know, so actually in our thing I called it Atari, but Xbox is good, that's a little bit more modern, I'm old school. Okay, anything else we're going to do in Atlas? So I've, I've heard that you think we're going to build cohorts. What are we going to do when we have a cohort? We want to do population level estimation. What, what, would we, what would we be doing if we were doing population level estimation? What question would we be answering? So we're, we're asking the question, does T increase the risk, T being Nintendo, increase the risk of O being colitis compared to C, which is Xbox? Okay. Following exactly the presentation that uh, Martine presented, we could just go through and, and do estimation. Anything else you guys want to do? We want to predict. So we could do patient level prediction. Okay, what would we predict? So among Nintendo users, who gets colitis? Okay, that could be possibly useful if, I, if anybody took anything away from uh, the lightning talk, I hope they took away Ishmael's presentation that this isn't actually all that far off about we're trying to figure out who's actually at risk for, for the problem because we could actually do something differently if we knew that they were at differential risk. Okay, any other tools that you saw today during Collaborator Showcase or, or during any of the presentations that you think might be useful? Athena. Athena. So we, we gotta figure out actually how to look for these things. Uh, we gotta, you know, like, like at least stick the cartridge in and blow on it twice before we can play Nintendo. So we gotta use, sorry, that's old school Nintendo reference. <laughs> All right. Uh, Athena for our vocabulary. Anything else? Okay. Well, so, so we've, got a, we've got a huge amount of data in this room. We've got a bunch of analytics. How many people stand up if you think that you can apply some of the analytics uh, already right now? Stand up. Okay. So like about... About a third of you right now feel comfortable that you can apply some analytics to some data. That's great. How many of you stand up if you're taking a tutorial for the next two days? Okay. I'm glad to see that's like the other two thirds. So hopefully you guys next year's symposium are gonna be standing up saying, yeah, I can actually perform analytics. So we perform analytics on these data to generate evidence. Let's. Uh, you heard from Danny and Nicholas and myself, but very specifically, what evidence are we trying to do? What is our, what is our goal for playing Nintendo? What question are we trying to answer? Yes? I'd like to know if there's a causal relationship. Is there a causal relationship? Is there a causal relationship? between uh, Nintendo and colitis? That is the question. Because what Uppsala is doing is they're going to report out a signal. That's going to go to our friends at the regulators, who are then going to actually have to take this information and actually decide, like, what are we going to do with this information? Are we going to put it on a product label? How are we going to communicate to patients to let them know that there's this new side effect that we didn't know about before? So it's kind of important that we actually do this process right and get good information. Okay, so we want to answer this causal question. Uh, we've got four particular, three and a half uh, credits for, um, for uh, Rebecca right now. So what I'm gonna do in the last seven minutes here is show you what uh, we did um, uh, using the Odyssey tools to support Rebecca in this process. And so I'm gonna deliberately do this rapid fire just to give you a sense of what is actually possible. 
So I got to attend the, the I got to attend the uh, Uppsala Sprint. Got to sit and actually watch all the great work that that the team is doing. And uh, we've actually talked about the fact that this sprint is probably a model we want to test out in. Um, in, in Eden, uh, and if anybody is just like interested in pharmacovigilance, you need to read the papers that are coming out of the Uppsala group and learn more about this process. I really think this is kind of the future of how we need to do drug safety. But I think that a, we could do a little bit better because by me being a fly on the wall and just sitting there and having access to data, having access to standard analytics, having access to the capabilities that are available from the Odyssey community, I was able to ask some simple questions. Like for example, I could start with a question, well, is this drug actually used in the real world? So indeed, just like you asked for, um, well, I started by actually going into our data sources tab. This is the tool Achilles that you heard about. And I was just able to search for Nintendo and I was able to see that, yeah, in one of my databases, I actually had patients who were taking Nintendo. And I was able to actually see a treatment utilization pattern that shows me who are taking this drug. So over time, we see Time on the x-axis going from 2014 when the drug was introduced to 2017, stratified by age and gender. So we can see not only that the drug is being used, we can see that it's actually increasing in use. We can see that it's used more in uh, older folks than younger folks, and it's used more in men than women. That's an important insight and potentially actually would be useful for us to just know about every product, which is why Danny presented the treatment utilization case, because this is always valuable. But I was interested specifically in knowing how many patients are newly used, so we created cohorts just like you asked for. So we said, let's find these new users in Nintendo using the Atlas tool to create a cohort. Specifically, I wanted to find new users in Nintendo who did not have prior colitis uh, because we want to make sure that if we're looking for a new event that those patients are actually at risk for the new event uh, like Nicholas presented earlier today. Now when I run Atlas as uh, Anthony presented, you're actually able to see not only how many patients uh, were in the initial cohort, so we had 1,200 patients in this particular database, but we can see that 6% of these patients actually had a prior di diagnosis of colitis, and so we can't use them for our patients, but already that's an important insight. Well, we didn't know that 6% of people had a prior colitis. Just knowing that would be potentially useful and informative to put context around this association. So we can also ask the question, not just how many patients do we have, but who are these patients? And so Anthony showed you the characterization tool. So here we could actually take a cohort of new users of Nintendo, a cohort of new users of Xbox, uh, and we could actually run a variety of different features on those. So we could look at their demographics, comorbidities, concomitant medications, use of uh, measurements, Charlson index, to basically ask the question, if we, um, to go to Danny's point that he asked, can we have an active comparator, means is there a meaningful comparison between two products? Products. Well, we need to actually assess that before we make a comparison. We could characterize those two populations based on all of these characteristics and actually look at how comparable these are. Anthony presented this to you earlier. Every dot here near the 45 degree line basically means the populations are similar. These dots that are the outlier, that represents the Nintendo people who had prior use of Xbox and the Xbox people who had prior use of Nintendo. We're probably going to have to kick those patients out of our study. Every other characteristic, though, is pretty close to the 45 degree line. As it turns out, we actually might be able to make a meaningful comparison between these two drugs. So that's good to know. And looking across thousands of characteristics. So we took that further and we actually wanted to ask the question, well, what's the incidence of the adverse event? Uh, and we could actually just take our cohorts across multiple databases and just actually count up how many cases of incident uh, colitis um, could we observe. Uh, we could stratify that by characteristics like age and gender, just to get a sense of, uh, from a personalized prediction perspective, we noticed that the rate of adverse events in the older population is higher than the rates uh, in the younger population. So maybe there's some sort of personalization that we could do. We can also stratify on other characteristics, like I was interested, maybe we stratify on the initial dose, because after all, Bradford Hill told us that we gotta think about uh, biologic gradient, so we might wanna actually think, is there a dose response? And actually, in this particular case, uh, the drug is supposed to be used at the initial high dose of 100 mg twice a day, and in fact, the vast majority, over 90% of people, start on that higher dose, a very small fraction start on a lower dose. That might mean that I can't really make this dose comparison, but already another insight. Turns out most people start on the high dose. That's useful because we didn't know that before. We had no idea what the dose was until we actually bothered to ask the real world data what's going on. <laughs> 
So we could design a comparative cohort analysis. I just followed Martine's lead uh, in going through this and actually looking at the risk of colitis amongst patients taking Nintendo versus Atari. Uh, and because of the entire Odyssey uh, methods library that Martine highlighted, we are not limited to one methods choice, but in fact there's lots of different methods that we could, we could look at. So actually specifically when I was thinking about this question I started, I was worried about this question of if there's going to be a good active comparator. So I thought well maybe we use a self-control design. I, I knew that coming into today Nicholas was going to present and say that self-controlled designs were a good idea. So I just knew that a month, two months ago and I said let's run a self-controlled design. And when we ran a self-controlled design we can see Nintendo compared to pre-exposure time had an elevated statistically significant increased risk on treatment. But of course we're really worried that that's just a, an anomalous finding and that that wouldn't be true. So we could run the same self-controlled cohort design on the comparator drug perf uh, Xbox and we run it on Xbox, we do not see that elevated increased risk. So now I'm starting to think, okay, well, it's not just that we've got a noise, a noise making machine, we've actually got something that might be interesting. But I've just run this on one database, that's not really helpful. What if I could actually replicate this across multiple databases? And so if we run on a different database using the same method, we saw a similar increased risk for Nintendo, not nearly as elevated. We still saw that our negative control remained negative. So I'm still feeling like, okay, this might be a little bit useful. Uh, and so then we said, well, what if we did run that active comparator study and we could run that using various different analysis flavors as Martine highlighted so we could think about propensity score stratification or matching, we could do on treatment or intent to treat. Um, but when we compare Nintendo to Profenadone, uh, all of those different flavors, I continued to see an increased risk that was statistically significant. Now, of course, what Martine and George already told you earlier today was that we need to follow best practices for this. We can't just be willy-nilly running stupid analysis. So we need to follow best practices and because the packages automatically generate things such as study diagnostics, I can compare the propensity score distribution and see, yeah, I can actually make a reasonable comparison between these two products. And I can run a large set of negative controls to basically see that more or less the statistics were pretty well calibrated. And this also gives me a little bit of a hint towards specificity because we were worried that we're just going to be generating a signal that's like a, in a sea of lots of signals. But in fact, what we're actually seeing here is um, that if there is something elevated, it's not just due to the noise that exists in the data. So Rebecca got three and a half stars um, for her work. And when I was sitting there, uh, I was just eager to say like, can I help her? improve her confidence in deciding whether or not uh, this, this is an association. So I'll make an opinion and then I'll let Rebecca share her thoughts, but I'll make the opinion that I think observational data can certainly help the strength of association uh, because now we actually have a denominator, we can actually produce an, ob an, an estimate of a relative risk. I would assert that the Odyssey network is unique in its ability to allow us to assess consistency because we can look at consistency across databases around the world. We can think about consistency across methods and so that we know that actually anything we observe is actually robust. I'd say I'll give myself half credit for specificity. We did use negative controls, so we know that this issue that popped up isn't just a spurious thing that would pop up anywhere. But as George and Martine presented, we actually have the opportunity to look across all outcomes, which means we could actually nail down how many things, known or unknown, are actually being produced. So I'll give myself half point for that. You know, temporality is interesting because we can look at time to event relationships in the data. One, we just know when the drug starts, we know when the outcome was uh, occurred, but we can actually actually look at that time to event relationship uh, in observational data in a way that you can't get if you're just limited to cases. And biologic gradient, well this is an interesting one. We saw that almost everybody was on the high dose, not the low dose, and actually the rate of events was switched. So the good news is our, our data could help us to explore biologic gradient. The bad news in this particular case, it didn't actually support the hypothesis, but instead it might have been producing a little bit of noise. Now Bradford Hill says there are nine different viewpoints for all uh, of which we should study association before we cry causation. Um, what I do not believe and has been suggested is that we can usefully lay down some hard and fast rule of evidence that must be obeyed before we can accept cause and effect. What, what they can do with greater or less strength is to help us make up our minds on the fundamental question, is there any way of explaining the set of facts before us in any other, uh, uh, is there any other answer equally or more likely, like, likely than cause and effect? So that was what Bradford Hill basically said about his viewpoints, but he's gone. So I'll ask Rebecca to explain what she thinks about whether or not this is useful. So I've assessed a lot of signals in my 10 years in pharmacovigilance. 
And when Patrick came to the UMC and showed me um, what we could what we could add to the signal assessment, I was well, I was kind of jumping out of my seat actually. Um, so um, I think it is. I, I, I'm a strong believer in that spontaneous adverse event reports, although they're quite incomplete, they're dirty data. Uh, I say that with with love. I believe in in adverse event reporting. Um, but they're very often criticized. Um, but to me, they are the first line of genuine real world evidence because they came from the mouth of a patient. Um, so to be able to see your real, your real world evidence as well in, in your observational databases support what these, these questions that we can start to ask, I think um, is an incredibly new um, area which can actually change the way we do pharmacovigilance actually. We're full of questions. You told, you told us when you came that you needed questions and I assured you that we could give you many. Thank you. And, and I think that the, the, one of the things I'm excited about for the Eden project is that these are questions that are going to come not just from uh, not just from UMC, but from all around the world. When these questions come, we as a community in action can take advantage of the data, can take advantage of the analytics tools, uh, and generate the evidence to actually provide answers to these questions that matter. I'm going to take one more second, Peter, to, to highlight. What about prediction? So we... So, so we actually tried to do prediction too during that day, uh, and we actually ran it, but we didn't. We're, we're not able to produce a prediction, and that was because we only had ten cases. So we were trying to predict amongst a thousand people who were the ten, and that was just not sufficient data to predict. But now we have a standardized package available to predict this, so that if when uh, Rebecca and the UMC team uh, ultimately decides that this is a safety signal, we can continue to monitor it, we can continue to predict, and um, we can continue to try to use that information to provide insights. And if there's some uh, regulatory action to take place, the one last one on this question is experiment. Well, we can actually use the world as our experimental platform. We are going to communicate about a potential risk, and then we will use treatment utilization to actually figure out, did we manage the risk appropriately? This is the vision and the, the, the value that our regulators are actually delivering to us today. We as an Odyssey community can deliver that. So if you are compelled to support Rebecca and UMC and pharmacovigilance, as, as I am, I encourage you to join us. But I'm going to guess that, uh, show of hands, how many of you want to still play Nintendo and help Rebecca? Most of you. Some still seem unconvinced. And so for those who are unconvinced, I'll just say one more thing. Uh, if you are not convinced that it's just a good thing for public health and because Rebecca's a swell gal and you want to help her, maybe you'd like to win a million dollars. Uh, in the U.S., CMS announced two days ago that they are holding an open competition for who can predict health outcomes. They announced this two days ago where they are basically making available U.S. Medicare claims data in the format that's the exact SINPUF data that you all are going to play in your tutorials on. Uh, and their question is, can you apply predictive models to this data to predict hospital readmission and uh, skilled nursing facilities? Uh, nursing facility activities, and adverse events. And specifically, if you can come up with a compelling way to apply machine learning and do it in a way that's actually interpretable to build trust and transparency with clinicians and patients, then not only will you make Rebecca happy, not only will you help public health, but you also put a little bit of cash in your pocket. Uh, I think it's actually uh, an imperative that we, as an Odyssey community in action, uh, try to apply for this. Not necessarily because we need the money, but I won't turn it down. But more because we have something unique. We have a network of data. We have a, a panel of analytics tools. We have a community of researchers that no other machine learning group or individual or team is actually going to be able to bring to this problem the unique perspectives we can. And so I would say that if we're going to think about Odyssey in action, I would encourage you all not to think about how you can do Odyssey in your own community, but how can we as a community start to solve some big problems that matter to patients and, and matter to the world. So with that, I will now turn it over to Peter.